So we're trying to say that these two mesh together. Look what it says. They're two sides of the same coin. What we measure is matter. What we feel is spirit. So they go together. Matter comes to life through spirit. Spirit comes through matter. And so these are the ways that we have divided the world up. You could add a whole bunch more. The rich, the poor, the white class, the other people. So we've divided the world up. And it's, I like to tell the story of the prodigal son. Jesus told that story of the father who had two sons. The youngest one says, hey, I'm out of here. Give me your estate, half the estate. After you die, give it to me now. And off he goes and lives and thrives until his money is gone. And the other son is at home taking care of the farm. And so what happens? Hard times hit. He's run out of money. He's, he's a Jewish boy. He's feeding pigs, which is a, something they don't like to do. And the food, he was saying the foods are get, that they were getting was something that he could eat. And he thought, my God, at home the hired men get better food than I do here. I'm going to go home and say, I'm sorry, Dad, get, let me be a hired man. So he trudges home, and his dad sees him and embraces him. Meanwhile, the son in the field saying, where's that twit of a brother? He was supposed to be helping me, and here he's not. And now he's come home, and they want to kill the fatted calf? What gives? You didn't give one for me. So we ask ourselves, and priests and ministers have asked, who am I? Am I the, the young son or am I the, the other son? And I want to say we are both. There are times when I waste my time and talent, run recklessly over things or life, and there are times when I am judgmental, critical, and entitled. I deserve that fatted calf. God loved, the Father loved both of them. And so it's not either or. We like to say it's both and. Well, we'll go back, but before we go all the way back, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Galilee and Copernicus. That, you know, they had, you know, probably just newly discovered telescopes, and, you know, they put it up to the sky and expected to see the stars, but lo and behold, they found out that we were on an axis rotating around the sun, and not only us, but several other planets, and it blew their minds with delight and surprise because, and the church condemned these teachings. Why? Because our thinking at the time was that the earth was the only thing in space and God created it and that's what it is. And look at the surprise, all these planets. And so science revealed something that our faith needed to embrace and break open. And so I'm saying the same thing. Now, in the last 100, 150 years, science has been telling us a few more things that is going to be opening our understanding of creation and of God and of our place in it. And so we begin with our story here, and we call it God's story. And it's a story that not only Christians can embrace, but all the world. And that's beautiful. Again, it's a sense of our oneness. So this flaring forth image that you see there began with a tiny little pinprick speck of power and energy of nucleus, and it exploded. And the scientists call it the Big Bang. And other scientists call it the flaring forth of light and energy and fecundity and power. And the light for us, it was bathed in light, and that's our expression of the divine. God was present, came from the heart of God. Spirit and matter were linked. And so the unfolding happened. It took years for all these chemicals and wonders, neutrons and whatever else, to come together. And they created hydrogen and helium. And then they found each other and they created stars. And these stars lived for millions of years. And when they died, especially the big ones. There was a supernova, 
which means that a big, long, they say, week, 10 days of burning up. And inside of that, it cooked up all the elements for future life, like iron, magnesium, zinc, copper, uranium, tungsten, all these elements that would eventually become are part of our future. And so with time, they came together and they collected and gathered. And what did we get? There it is. It took four and a half billion years when this emerged, but we started with 13.7. So you see, God's work is slow, methodical, beautiful, unfolding. The universe began, and now we have our Earth, and it's water and life and land, and below what emerged was the beginning of life. The simple cells developed and, de and grew, and we have life. Plants grew. They captured sunlight, producing air, and the fish arrived around four billion years ago. Half a billion years for the earth to come to life and allow the earliest elements to emerge. And so, following that, we have another major shift in our unfolding. The dinosaurs emerged 235 million years, along with plants and trees and the environment needed for them. And so they were there, and then an asteroid hit them 65 million years ago, somewhere in around Mexico area. So they ended, but God had another surprise. There was another quantum leap. Each time after the era of fish came the quantum leap, the dinosaurs, now comes the quantum leap of mammals. And so the simple mams, mammals emerged out of the trees, the little guy over there, and then the monkeys, 36 million years ago, the deer, 19, the elephant, 7 million years. There are many other in group, uh, animals, but time is short here, so we're keeping it to, <laughs> to it. So this is their unfolding. Life becomes more complex. And so, to our surprise, we have the next gift. God created humans and they emerged out of Africa about seven million years ago. They learned to have to use tools, discover fire, and hunting and gathering. And so life has become more complex, and that's our story, our history of how we began. What would you say to us to actually live out God's dreams for this world? That's a big question, and that's going to be the question for us to live, you know, into. And that, it begins with small steps. It starts with our heart and with the human realization that we are not the top of the pinnacle. We are part of this community. And so we want to ponder that. Take some time to walk in nature. Keep the headsets and all that stuff at home. Just walk in nature. And I'll tell you a story. When I was writing my master's in this stuff, I was so frustrated. My paper wasn't coming together, and the deadline was there, and I had to type it, and blah, blah, blah. And so I said, well, I'm going to go and get a Snickers. <laughs> you know, when you get tired, I need a Snickers. And it's just a block or two away. So I went. But on the way up, some way, I woke up and there was the park. I said, well, I'll go walk, walk off what I'm going to eat. <laughs> well, I went into the park and there were swans and the water and they were playing and they had their two heads together in the shape of a heart. I sat there and watched them. Then some others came along and there were flowers and other birds and just an array of things. I just calmed right down. And I went home. No Snickers bar. I went home and I wrote, I was inspired. A walk in nature walks your soul back home. And so that's what happened. So did I answer your question or I got off on a tangent here? Well, yeah, we said about, uh, oh, yes. you know, practically, right? So yes. Spending walks time in, in nature. nature. Yeah, in the last yes. piece. And uh, another thing is, what are we doing with our clothes, particularly jeans? If you saw that CBC documentary, they said the second polluting factor of our planet, beyond gas and oil, is our clothing industry because they use gobs of water and poison uh, dyes that poisons the water 
and no life can live. The fish and everything else have died. We wear clothes, we wear something for six months and throw it out. It's that whole attitude of, again of object use. Come to respect where does it come from, what does it cost the earth to have that made. Also, you can write to letters to the government with regard to protecting forests, no factory farms, chemicals and plastics in the waters. At home, you can watch your food and your wastage of it. They say we waste so much food. Composting, recycling, by using cloth bags for shopping, eliminating the plastic. When you're taking your showers, how long do you stay in there? I've got a couple of nephews. They've got some kind of music gizmo. They have playing music while they're showering. I'm saying, they groan when I say, hey, come on, cut back. <laughs> that seems dangerous, you know, listening to music in the shower. What well, it, it must be giz set up some way that you don't get a shock with Crazy it. Crazy so. gizmos. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> also, how do you use water when you're preparing your vegetables? Do you let the water run? You just dab your lettuce underneath? <laughs> bad, bad. <laughs> Food preparation. Laundry. Do you wash your laundry when you have three towels in it instead of waiting till you get a load? Power with lights on. Are they on every place that looks like a hotel? And also the furnace. Shorts are not necessary in winter. Wear longer pants and an extra sweater. Keep the heat down. Now these are all technical economic things, but if you look at them, look at them with a heart. They are gifts given. How am I using them? The earth doesn't need us. The sun doesn't need us. And then lastly, or the church. That we encourage that our churches to have a prayer intention to keep it in our consciousness so we're slowly wanting to make this shift from the earth not as an object but something sacred to be respected and then also when you have your social gatherings glass dishes please no styrofoam that pollutes and chokes out the earth plastic paper and plastic forks all of these are things that we can do away with it means taking more time, washing the dishes, but it's communication time, it's socializing time. We can think of that that way.